Hello. Hi, uh, so uh, thanks for coming, everyone. Um, my name's Fergus. Uh, this is my colleague, Shimon. And we uh, want to talk to you a bit today around some of the work that we've been doing in the Green Software Foundation, which is uh, one of the foundations under the Linux Foundation umbrella. Um, I'm the chair of one of the projects, and Shimon is the co-chair of one of the projects. So we're just going to kind of explain a little bit about what the uh, Green Software Foundation does. Uh, and a little bit more uh, detail about the, the projects that we've been running for a while and then a, a bit of information about how you can get involved um, uh, as well. So the two projects we're going to be talking about today is uh, an introduction to the two projects, the first one of which is the Carbon Aware SDK, which Shimon will be talking over, and then uh, the Carbon, Carbon CICD pipeline, which I will uh, discuss and share as well. So I'm just going to hand over to Shimon to go through our agenda for today. Right. Thanks. So we're going to start off by doing a quick intro to GSF, what GSF is about, then move on to explaining what SCI is, which is uh, one of the most used specifications in the GSF as well, and then go through the Carbon Aware SDK with a quick intro to what Carbon Awareness is, and a short demo of, carbon, of the project itself, and then moving on to the CICD pipeline um, towards the end. Cool. So what is the software, uh, the Green Software Foundation? Who's it for? Uh, what does it do? Um, so yeah, come on in, please. Thank you. Um, so the Green Software Foundation is a not-for-profit organization aiming to build a trusted ecosystem of people, standards, toolings, and also best practices. So today we're going to talk a little bit more about the tooling specifically. Um, so some of the projects that we're running in order to, ge to generate uh, the tooling that, that people can use to ensure that they, they're getting green software. Um, so there is, I'll, I'll just sort of brush over these so we can get into the demo and things, but um, there is a manifesto online which you can, can read um, if you just Google Green Software Foundation or um, greensoftware.foundation is the website. Uh, you can read the manifesto, but the mission really is to build a trusted ecosystem of people, standards and toolings and uh, as well as best practice. And the, the vision is to actually change the culture across the tech industry to get developers thinking more about green software practices, to get um, you know, product owners and managers to think about the impact of green software when developing um, anything. So there's kind of two sides uh, that the Green Software Foundation sees to sustainability. The first one is sustainability within technology. So sustainability within the technology that we're using. So if you think about um, your laptop, you've got hardware, chips, software, all sorts of thing, uh, all sorts of carbon going into the manufacturer, but also the running of your laptop, the energy that it uses, but also the cloud service, the energy in the cloud service it relies on. But then also this is like, there's this idea of sustainability with technology. This might be looking at how we can improve uh, efficiency of processes to make them more carbon, less carbon intensive. Uh, it may be looking to uh, increase biodiversity using technology, AI, camera systems, whatever it might be. Um, we're, today we're going to mostly talk about sustainability in technology because this is really where green software comes into play, making the technology that we're actually using every day uh, more sustainable. Great, thanks. Um, I just wanted to call out quickly the scope of what we're talking about today across green software. Um, so we are talking about software, uh, things like facilities management, and especially energy usage will come up quite a lot because that's where the majority of the, of the carbon in using technology is going to come from. We do also consider in, uh, embodied carbon, which is basically the carbon that it took to manufacture a, a chip or a computer or a server um, that is kind of essentially trapped in that device until it's recycled or reused. Um, we do consider that, but there are some aspects of, of green software which have kind of blurred out a little bit on the screen. The things like water usage, so the amount of water it takes to produce um, a device. You may have seen adverts um, around online around the amount of water that it takes to produce a smartphone, and why using a refurbished smartphone is much um, uh, has a, has a great impact on the environment just because of the water usage alone that goes into to manufacturing smartphones. Uh, and also things like single-use products, so all of the plastic forks and bags that we've probably been using this week, uh, and things like business travel as well. Those aren't things that we're looking at directly, I just wanted to call them out as, as important things to remember when we're talking about um, green software uh, and sustainability in general. 
Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail on this slide, but it is in the slide deck if you do want to review it. This is our <coughs> SCI specification. What is SCI? SCI is software carbon intensity. So this is really um, a methodology around calculating the rate of carbon efficient uh, rate of carbon uh, excuse me emissions for a software system. So that includes all our, uh, everything within the software. So the energy efficiency of that software, the hardware efficiency of that software, um, and the the carbon awareness. Um, so <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so this is really a methodology for measuring the the carbon in software and the purpose is to help users and developers be more informed about their choices uh, about what they're developing what they're deploying and what technologies they are using uh, so that they're more aware of the carbon impact in uh, and around the basically what we're developing every day right so what do you actually need to create uh, an SCI score? Well, we've come up with some, some steps here. Uh, first is decide what you're actually measuring at any one point, and we'll talk a little bit about this in, the, in both of the projects. Um, so we call this the software boundary. So which actual have a think about which actual components you are looking at in, the, in what you're trying to measure the SCI. The second thing which I'd like to call out as kind of specifically important is what we call the scale. And this is essentially what you're measuring against. So the software carbon intensity per what? If, for example, you were just creating an API, that might be per API call. If you had a full website, it may be per user, it may be per, um, per transaction. There's lots of different ways you can measure that, which is quite important, but that needs to be uh, stable for the software that you're um, measuring against and it needs to make sense for the use case. Uh, you then need to think about how uh, you're actually measuring that, what quantification methods are you actually using. This is a big, uh, a big question mark around S uh, SCI is because that data source needs to be reliable. We need to know uh, how much energy a particular chipset is using or a particular data service is using. So how are you actually measuring that? And then quantifying that. So for each, every value within your boundary, quantify the software carbon intensity. And then the fifth and final one is report. How are you actually thinking about reporting that back to the user, back to the developer, so they can actually make informed choices. And we'll talk a little bit more about the type of choices they might make uh, when we actually go through the projects themselves. And then four and five, I won't go into too much detail around the specifics of the software boundaries um, and the core characteristics. Um, but this is just the, the, the full specification. So, so uh, these slides are available, so please do go through um, and have a look. Um, but just to like go back to the point of what the SCI is, it's the this is a methodology for calculating the rate of carbon emissions for any software system. So it doesn't actually matter what the software system is. Using these, these five steps, we can, we can calculate the SCI and then use that as a baseline to compare against other applications, uh, other pieces of software. And the aim is, would es essentially be to reduce the SCI, um, the software carbon intensity of any piece of software or uh, de development that we are, are building. So um, I'll hand over to Shimon now to go over the specifics for the Carbon Aware SDK. Thanks, Figures. So um, before I introduce Carbon Aware SDK itself, I have to do a quick intro to, to what actually is Carbon Awareness. And we will start off by just simply explaining what it, what it actually is. So Carbon Awareness in principle is simply doing less when the electricity is dirty and doing more when it's clean. And what do we understand by cleanness on dirtiness of energy. Um, if you look at the diagram here on the left, uh, basically energy is more clean when the composition of where the energy comes from is more uh, focused on um, renewable energy. So stuff like wind or solar. Then we can see that the carbon intensity, so how much carbon is produced per kilowatt hour is smaller. So that is well, what it actually mostly is about. 
and how do we actually apply carbon awareness in software? So how do we use it? There are two main methods of doing that. The first one is by doing time shifting. So that's um, moving our, um, shifting our load to different times of day, because basically electricity might be cleaner at a different time of day. Maybe like in the, at noon or something, there is more sun. So there is more solar in the grid and then there is a smaller carbon intensity. So by time shifting, we can take tasks that can be performed asynchronously. So such things like training an AI model or maybe processing some invoices and doing it either later during the day or even at a completely different time. And then the other option is by doing location shifting. So location shifting, it's a very similar principle, but instead of moving it in time, we are moving it in space. So we are looking at what other locations the electricity might be cleaner. So some tasks that aren't like region bound, um, which for example, the data doesn't need to be specifically in that region, they can be moved anywhere at all. We can move to a different location um, to produce less carbon. And I'll touch upon some of the carbon aware pain points. I won't dive into them too deeply because um, we want to get to the demo. I think that's our main core of the presentation here. Um, but some of the most important carbon aware pain points uh, is understanding the return of investment. So why do we actually might want to uh, care about carbon awareness? Um, what do we gain from it? Um, next one is disparate integration approaches. This being a new thing, there's a lot of different teams trying to achieve this at the same time. And we want to prevent people from reinventing the wheel every single time. Um, so we don't create different approaches with uh, different data sources because that just is going to be too hard to track what is actually the, the standard. Um, next thing is that, that teams are blocked without data providers. So if we don't have access to carbon intensity data or other stuff, there is no way of uh, moving forward. Auditability is um, another thing. So we need to understand why certain business decisions are made. Why do we decide to actually shift some load to a different region? Um, what is the actual gain from it? Next one is the integrity of approaches. So how can we actually be sure that we are not greenwashing stuff? So how do we know that the data we're using, the data which, on which we base our um, carbon aware decisions isn't, isn't false or isn't uh, skewed to, 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 to cause us to make false decisions? Um, Another thing is that there's, well, you might notice as well that there's an increasing pressure in legislature and regulatory compliance uh, from bodies like EU, for example, to, to push towards uh, making greener software and uh, businesses might want to get ahead of, of that problem and to address it before it even becomes the problem and be ready for when carbon awareness is going to be the standard, not the option. And finally, this all leads up to the need for a unified approach to have a single, single tool to, well, to address and to create carbon aware products. So why a carbon aware SDK? Uh, we'll start off by showing what our carb the carbon aware SDK we at GS have developed. So it is a piece of software that sits between your application, which might be somewhere in the cloud or uh, locally on your computer and the data providers. So the data might be coming from data sources such as what time or electricity maps, uh, or it can be even your own data you've collected and you've used. And what the SDK does is it gives you a single uh, interface for incorporating carbon awareness into our applications for a single point for adding uh, carbon optimization logic as well. So if around through the business, you have uh, some already predefined um, options for calculating stuff around carbon or decisions that you make around carbon, instead of making them, um, repeating them for every single piece of software, you can just have a single, single point of action where you analyze the data and you just pull the SDK and you get all of the data from, from that single cent centralized point. Um, sorry, let me just, yeah. And um, the other thing that's quite important is it gives you the option to, um, to measure the operation carbon intensity of your platform. So what that means is it, it can let you check 
what is the carbon density at right now at this current point by checking the current carbon density data or even allows you to run hypothetical models. So looking at future data and predicting how your software, how your mo uh, platform might do in the future. And the next one, um, some of these points are already repeated as well, so I'll run through them quickly. So we do want a centralized carbon aware intelligence. We do want a single spot where, which, which we access to, um, to make our carbon, carbon aware decisions um, from. So we don't want to repeat this in every single piece of software. We just want a single one. Um, the SDK gives us the option to also abstract the data providers. We don't have to have custom APIs for each one of them. We can just pull the single SDK or API um, and still get the same results, no matter if it's what time that's your uh, data provider, electricity maps, or even your own data you've collected. Um, once again, it lets you abstract the carbon logic away from your software to a single spot um, and gives you the option to also protect and manage secret keys, secrets and keys. Uh, for accessing those uh, services. Um, so you don't have to do that in your own software. You have a single spot where you do it. And I'll move on to the demo. Um, I think I'll have to put away the microphone, so hopefully you can still hear me fine without, without it. Okay, great. And uh, let me move, jump to the demo. So the demo is in a uh, Jupyter Notebook because uh, let's be honest, carbon awareness is also something that is quite important to uh, data scientists as well, and this being a tool that's often, often used by them, I decided to create a demo in, in, the, uh, in a notebook. And uh, we'll start off by just throwing a number at you. Uh, generally, what I've come to a conclusion after running through those calculations is that making carbon, uh, by making applications carbon aware, we can decrease the carbon footprint of software by up to 76%. So that's based on the data we are analyzing later on um, in, this slide, in, this, uh, in this notebook. So that's pretty, pretty a big, quite a big improvement, in my opinion. Um, and we'll start off by simply showing off uh, time shifting. So as I mentioned before, carbon awareness can be applied by two main principles, by like time shifting and location shifting. So we start off with time shifting, and the scenario is that we have a software engineer that is running some computationally intensive uh, data processing job, and he's running it at 8.55 p.m. every single day, and the job is run in West Central US uh, Azure Data Center. Um, and what they want, want to do is they want to see if maybe running it at a different time of day um, might produce less carbon emissions, um, because maybe there is more solar energy in that grid during the day. So what they do is they can run the uh, SDK. So I'm not gonna run through all of the cells, but we can already see the results because I've pre-run them before this talk. Um, what we want to focus on here is this section because this is just initialization of the SDK. And then this is actually what is pulling the SDK. So what he does is he gets, uh, he, he calls the gets emission uh, data for location by time uh, endpoint. So maybe I should explain what's actually happening here because I haven't really introduced that. What we have here we have is we have the SDK deployed as a web API somewhere in, uh, somewhere in the cloud. And uh, what we are doing here in code is uh, we're just configuring it because what we have is uh, we have a client library that interacts with the SDK, right? Um, and uh, what we can do now is we can simply pull the already deployed SDK and get data from it. Uh, in this particular instance, we're using what time as the data provider. Um, yep. Can we just check the time? Okay, we're still fine. Um, so what the software engineer can do is they can pull it to see uh, the time from, from the beginning of the day until the end, and they, they first they can check um, what is the well what is the current carbon intensity. So at the time they're running it at 8:55 p.m. when they pull it, we can see that it's 928.5 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. So that's quite a bit. 
Uh, and what they can do next is they can call a different uh, endpoint. So it's the emissions by locations best endpoint of, of, of the SDK. What that endpoint gives you is um, the best time and location uh, with the lowest uh, carbon intensity. So they provide as input uh, the region they're, sorry, they're interested in, the start time, which is uh, 12 a.m. previous uh, of, of that day uh, until the end of that day. And what they get in response after running this query is they get the region which they're interested in. So that's the Western truly S, but simply mapped to, to the what time region, so the data provider region. And they get the carbon, carbon rating of that. So we can see that by just moving it from 8.55 p.m. to 11.55 p.m., so that's the time we receive, um, the carbon footprint can be decreased by 47%, and that's based on a single data point of a single day. So what we can do now is we can do the same thing, but looking at it on a 55-day scale. So what would have happened if you did, did this 55 days ago? The SDK also allows us to do that because it's auditable. It allows us to check how the data would have been some time ago. Um, so what we do now is one, once again pull the SDK and we get all of the data for 55 days and we sort it nicely uh, using some Python tricks um, to get only the data at 11.55 in that region. We put it in a table and we can see in comparison for all the different days um, from 22nd of June this year up to the 15th of August um, for the 8.55 time and 11.55 at that region. And if we plot it on a graph, we can see that on average at 11.55 um, the carbon intensity here is much lower than at 8.55. And if we were to do some calculations and get the average uh, percentage decrease, overall, uh, over those 55 days ago, if we did this shift 55 days ago, we'd have a 38.76% decrease. So it's a bit smaller, smaller than on the day we looked at before, but overall it's still quite a big, a big, big decrease, sorry, not an increase, a big decrease in the carbon in uh, carbon emitted. Let me just check the time. Okay, still good to go. So this is time shifting. Next we're looking at is location shifting. So um, let's say that the uh, software engineer we're looking at, he is currently restricted to only work in the US regions because that's his company policy and he cannot move outside that. That's a fairly valid restriction. So we're looking at those particular uh, Azure regions we're interested in, and once again, we're only looking at uh, at the time that was of interest for us, the time we found best to do that job in that particular region, so 11.55. And what we get is that the best region to do it for, once again, we determine the best region by pulling the emissions by location's best endpoint, and we get that the best region is AZPS, which maps to the Azure region West US3. And just by looking at the, uh, at the location shift on a single data point, we already get a 30.3% uh, decrease of uh, carbon emissions. So already another increase, and that's on top of the previous one. So that's not uh, combined, that's a further 30.3% decrease. And what we can again do is do a little experiment by looking what would have happened if we did this 55 days ago. Um, so how would we have, how much would they have saved carbon if we did this 55 days ago? Are we still fine for time? Or to, okay, lovely. Um, so again, we repeat the same thing as for the time, but instead we look at the locations. So we uh, pull the emissions by locations endpoint. What that endpoint gives us is the emission data for a list of locations in a particular uh, time window. And the locations we're interested in is the West Central US, so the one that where we originally performed that task, and West US3. 
and after sorting the data and putting it in a nice panda data frame, um, we have all the data here where we can compare it um, and we'll just move on to the plot so we can see it more visually and this blue line here is the new region we're looking at, so the West US free region at 11.55 p.m. And this is the West Central US region at 11.55. So if you remember correctly, before when we looked at West Central US, there was a, we looked at, um, was it 8, 8.50 or something like that, and that had an even higher um, carbon intensity index of all, of all of those days. And we can see that this always is almost always be, uh, under West Central US. So if you look at the average average decrease, we can see that it isn't as good, sorry. <laughs> Missed clicking. Um, it isn't as great as on that day. Um, and we can even see that on the graph that this day was very lucky. There was a very big uh, dip, but still on average, it's a further 18.18% decrease over the 55 days. So that's uh, still a really good result. And the last thing we're looking at is uh, we're looking at the location shift globally. So something I only touched upon previously during the presentation but haven't fully mentioned is that if our company, for example, has a restriction for us to stick, stick to only a certain region, to a certain country, maybe we cannot move our data outside of our country for some reason uh, because it's sensitive, uh, we can still look how how our uh, carbon intensity, carbon emissions would have changed if we could do it anywhere in the world. And maybe build a business case to convince our, uh, our company to change its, uh, change its regulations so we can move it somewhere else. So here we're looking globally, we're looking at uh, almost all of the Azure regions that are supported um, by what time. And once again, we are using the handy emissions by locations best endpoint. And what we get here is that the best location to perform this task is actually France. And it has a carbon rating of 257 grams. And again, here, in this place, we are only looking at the single date of data. It's the same day we looked at previously at 11.55 p.m. And just by looking at that day, we get a decrease from uh, the original uh, region, which was, uh, uh, I mean, sorry, we get a further decrease of 25.38%. Uh, so let's confirm that by looking at the bigger batch of data, uh, looking at 55 days. So this is just repeated, so I'm just gonna scroll through it and get to the graph, which is easier to, to look at and more pleasant. So once again, we are only looking at 11.55 because we have decided that this is the best time in West Central US region. And we can again see that this was our initial location shift, which gave us a again a decrease. And this, if we could have moved it to France, would have been an, a, yet another quite big um, carbon emission in, uh, decrease. So if we go down to it, and look at the average, we can see that the carbon intensity percentage, so I'll maybe I'll point here. So the carbon intensity percentage decreased as a result of location shifting from West US3. So from here to France Central would have been 41%. And the result of doing the location shift from the original region, from West Central West, would have been 51.76%. So as we can see, carbon awareness definitely does play a big role in making our, um, our software more green because just by being carbon aware and just by looking at location and time and not running it uh, by default as a nightly build, always at night because that's how it, we always did it, or always at 8 p.m. because uh, yeah, that's how we always did it uh, for that project. We can look at different times, different locations and make our decisions more informed about uh, um, well, the carbon produced. Okay, and let me jump back to the presentation. Um, so we're gonna skip, or maybe I'll just do a quick run through. Uh, well, once again, revisiting the, the, end po uh, the pain points 
So what we get from the SDK is we actually have the ability to run hypothetical models and understanding, um, well, what is the impact of moving stuff, uh, of actually making our uh, application carbon aware and how can we look at in the future or in the past, as we saw uh, in the demo. Uh, we get a single unified approach to create a standardized tooling, um, give the developers a single, a single tool to use so they don't have to learn uh, different ways how we can apply carbon awareness, but just use a single tool and apply it for, for everything. Uh, something I haven't mentioned before is the, the SDK gives you, uh, uses Swagger and OpenAPI to generate uh, SDKs for well up to 50 languages supporting by OpenAPI. So it's not limited to just, uh, to just uh, .NET or uh, which we develop it in, but it can be almost any language, uh, many, any, any mainstream language available. Um, it is highly auditable, so we are, have the ability as shown in the demo, to uh, replay and understand why some decisions were made or why they weren't made. So we can always look back at 55 days ago or how many days ago we wanted to and see if the decision was correct or what it could have been, how it could have been different. It has high integrity because all the data sources we use are known and are confirmed to, to give us uh, good data. So, um, and well, being an open source project, anyone can always jump in and verify if it is or if it isn't. And finally, audibility uh, by having centralized logging. Um, so similar to this, we can always confirm if the decision was uh, correct or not. And the final point, uh, I guess this is also with a bit of a, pl a shameless plug, it's highly hackathonable. So right now as GSF, we are starting a, a Carbon Hack 2020. Um, so you, I don't have a link here, but I can share it with you later if you want or put it in the slides. Um, and this is a hackathon uh, running around the Carbon Aware SDK for producing and, and using Carbon Aware um, software. So if you are interested, there are some prizes involved as well, but also can give you quite a good head start to, to using um, the, the SDK and uh, becoming a green software engineer as well. And I'll hand off to Fergus now to, to talk about the Carbon Site Pipeline project. Great, thank you. So um, Shimon has perfectly explained um, the some of the benefits of, do of doing this location and time shifting uh, to reduce your software carbon intensity. Um, and I think the interesting thing to take away is looking back 55 days is useful for that audit process, but it's, it's not useful to reduce the carbon in those 55 days, right? So what, what um, we're also looking at in the Green Software Foundation is the idea of putting these tools straight into your CI, so your continuous integration pipeline. Um, right now, what does that look like? What does continuous integration look like? Well, we have these cycles of kind of code, test, build, code, test, build, and then test, release, and deploy, um, which are you know, fairly standard processes. Uh, they're well understood. We have lots of tools to deal with those. But the result really is that once we get to that deploy section, um, we just, uh, if we're talking about a cloud deployment, for example, we kind of throw a, a, a load of resources up into the cloud and then they're running. They, we know where they are, we know what time of day they're running, but we haven't measured the SCI. We haven't thought about this, the impact on the environment from that software or any of the, the elements that are running in there. So when we do a measurement, like using the Carbon Aware SDK, and we look at the uh, SCI, we pretty usually get a bad measurement, so one of those high graphs, right? Um, so is there a better way? Um, <clears throat> because by using tools like the Carbon Aware SDK, we can do some of those location shifts, we can do some of those time shifts, we can even scale things like uh, things down if we're not actually using them to get a better SCI score. But by this point, it's already too late. If you've made the changes 55 days, 100 days, whatever it is later, you've already wasted uh, energy and carbon. So our idea with this new project is to put a new step into the continuous integration uh, uh, cycle, which is assess. So at each point, uh, at both points of your build and test cycle and your release and deploy, you're actually assessing your SCI before that deployment. So you're actually getting a score for what your future uh, carbon, uh, S your software carbon intensity will be in the future. So you can actually make the decisions about where to deploy things, when to deploy things, 
uh, what elements you want to deploy before you actually click deploy and before they actually start generating carbon. Um, so what do we need? Well, uh, Shimon's thankfully already covered uh, some of this. This is just a screenshot of the electricity map API. And this is a graphical representation of the carbon intensity of different electricity grids around Europe. So you can see uh, from when this was taken, France is coming up quite well. That's why uh, in the SDK suggests France quite often because they do a lot of nuclear energy. Um, often the Nordics are very good because they have a lot of hydro uh, um, hydropower. Uh, and other countries burning more coal and gas may come up um, as as red and uh, uh, countries to, to potentially avoid um, if they're not using as many renewable energies at any point. The other thing we need to know is how much um, how much energy our compute resources are actually using at any one time. And this is uh, you know an area where we we need a lot of collaboration across different organisations to actually understand what chipsets are using, uh, different amounts of power, and how that's going. Uh, what's the last thing that we need is you. So everyone, uh, everyone here at the Linux Foundation can join up to the Green Software Foundation, get involved in these projects, start contributing to both the Carbon Aware SDK. So this is um, uh, the projects page on the Green Software Foundation website. So here's uh, Shimon in the Carbon Aware SDK, and the Carbon CI pipeline tooling is here as well. We definitely need uh, you know more developers, more help with people who are interested in sustainability uh, as well. Um, I put the link here, so it's greensoftware.foundation. You can go there to, to learn more. Um, we do have a couple of minutes for questions. If anybody has any questions in the room or online, please do let us know. We'll do the, our best to answer them in the next couple of minutes. Yes. I'll come over with the microphone. Um, yeah. What is the input data? Is it a standard format, or can it be different uh, in other, uh, across uh, many countries? Yeah, this is a really good question. Um, <clears throat> the tools that we've been looking at in terms of electricity map and what time are standardized across the, 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 the globe in the regions that they have access to the data for, which is really, really helpful. Um, what isn't standardized is the data that, and is more difficult to get, I would say, is the, the data coming from different providers. So if we have a you know an SQL server, for example, running in Azure, if we have an SQL running uh, server running in AWS, we can figure out if we know how much electricity they use, we can use tools like Electricity Map or What Time to figure out how much uh, carbon is related to the energy they use. But we need to know from the providers how much energy is used, and that's where there isn't a standardization right now. So there is a project in the Green Software Foundation to try and do that data the standardization. Um, but we would definitely invite you if you if you have an interest to sign up and, and and help with that, because that's something we're actually working towards is getting to a point where we have a nice standardized data and a really good understanding of, of what different resources are, are using different amounts of energy uh, at any time. But yeah, so that's that's something we're actively working towards, but isn't necessarily available um, from every different provider. Good question. Um, any other last questions? Maybe we have one time for one more. Yeah. So my question is just around, is there any intention to possibly get this automated in the cloud service providers, for example? So getting them to do this as opposed to me forecasting and then deciding? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it, it depends on the uh, cloud provider. I don't know if you want to add any, anything, but I would say it depends on the cloud provider. I would say for uh, it's definitely of, of interest. Do you want to add like 20 seconds? Yeah. Sure. I mean, Basically, like at this point, obviously we want we want the cloud providers to get interested and to actually care about this. So I guess our approach is to start doing it, and once they have uh, pressure from other people and other organizations to start doing it, maybe then one of the providers will eventually decide, hey, this is something we're interested in. Maybe let's join in the effort and start doing it. And once one follows, hopefully others will as well. Awesome. So I think we're out of time, but so thank you so much for for coming. Um, and asking questions. If you have any more questions for us, we'll be uh, around after the event. Um, but yeah, please do visit the link. Uh, have a look at some of the other projects as well. This is just two of many projects under the Green Software Foundation. But thank you very much. I got involved. <laughs>